Thank you for coming out to Rich Smith's talk. This is Pyretic, Reversing Obfuscated Python Bytecode and Live Python Objects. If you're not in the talk that you want to be, I would suggest that you stick around. This looks like it'll be a very cool talk. And now I'll turn it over to Rich. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear? Okay. It's a weird room because it's like a little wider than it is long. So I'll just be vacantly looking at both screens each time. Um, so as a, as a the title of the talk says we're going to be talking about reverse engineering at the Python layer rather than the C layer, which is what m more people are familiar with. Um, we're going to talk about why, in some cases, uh, reversing at the Python layer or at higher level languages is actually uh, more desirable than going straight down into the C or straight down into the assembly. So as you'll see from my swishy intro, um, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about Python language in general, some areas of Python that uh, people who program in it may not be so familiar with. Um, programming in Python and, and obviously how the underlying runtime works uh, is, is fairly different. So uh, we're going to cover some fundamentals around the Python language. We're going to cover why are we even looking at reversing Python. Uh, we're going to talk about the anti-reversing uh, technologies and techniques that people are starting to put in place to stop people reversing out Python. Um, and then obviously we're going to talk a little bit about the toolkit that I've pulled together to um, you know, evade some of these uh, existing uh, anti-reversing techniques, and all being well, there'll be a demo that will work. So, why are we reversing Python? You know, what, why did we even bother with the task of going at the Python layer rather than just going straight down, dropping into the, a debugger, and looking at C? Well, there was uh, a security posture of some applications, shall we say, that needed to be looked at. We wanted to look at how well the Python was being coded, not how well the runtime was being implemented. We want to assess the code of the Python application, not the C Python runtime itself. Um, obviously, working at the Python layer allows you to assess the application's code as opposed to looking at the underlying runtime's code. That's not to say that there aren't bugs in the underlying runtime that are worth finding, but <clears throat> it's a different task. And we found that a lot of the available tool sets worked fine on standard Python. You know, if it was standard bytecode that was produced in, uh, in the normal ways, the decompilers and everything that was around worked well. As soon as there was any attempt by the author of the code to try and change things around a little bit, to obfuscate, to do some anti-reverse engineering techniques, everything fell down. And that's mainly because um, there hasn't really been a huge amount of work done on this. Um, there hasn't been necessarily uh, a huge need because a lot of the Python code is obviously distributed in uh, its source code format as a .py. You don't need to reverse it. Um, but obviously, things are changing. People are using Python in increasing amounts, and people are using it for commercial uh, applications in increasing amounts. So, if we look in a general case, you know, what are the what are the changes? What are the, are the trends? Well, none of this should be a surprise to anyone. People are moving away from C and C++ for exactly the same reasons that half of the talks at this conference are happening is because C and C++ is hard. People have to do a lot of their own management. They'll go to higher level languages. Um, obviously, Python's one example, but there's you know, a lot of people working in Ruby. Lua's being huge in the scripting uh, engines for games, etc. Uh, and a lot of the higher level things that we'll talk about today apply just as much to other high level scripting languages, and uh, in some cases, even uh, up to kind of C-sharp, .NET type languages. Um, so we're exemplifying it with Python. But you can take the principles and you can apply it to any other high-level languages. There's also been significant changes with how software's been distributed. Uh, five years ago, everything, you downloaded a binary and, you, and that was all the software. Now it's obviously software as a service, Web 2.0, the cloud, you know, all the new buzzwords. Everyone gives you a small client app that then goes into their service online. Uh, it's, you know, it's a portal. A lot of the logic is kept online. Uh, everybody has you know, REST APIs, etc. So there's a huge shift in how the software is actually being distributed. Um, this shift means that a lot of the reverse engineering methodologies and approaches also need to shift. There needs to be updated uh, thoughts around how the best way to go around reverse engineering in this new environment is with higher level languages, with more service oriented uh, distribution models. Um, overflows aren't the only bugs. There's a huge amount of bugs that can be very, very useful that aren't overflows, that aren't you know, Nico-style heap attacks. Uh, they are just you know, plain logic flaws in the source code of Python or Ruby or whatever. 
Um, and if you've seen any of the talks, uh, probably some later today, and certainly in the pro programmatic track yesterday, the return on investment, the amount of effort that needs to be put into reversing a modern memory corruption bug is huge. You know, six, 12 months worth of dedicated research time, that's expensive. Um, if you can do three weeks of research on a bug and get just as much leverage, then you've got a much, much better ROI than you had before. A lot of tools, techniques, very C-centric. You know, everyone's come up through the, uh, through the schooling of there's a, uh, a, a compiled binary and it can't go back to where it came from without a lot of work. Obviously, modern languages are all reflective. You distribute the binary, you're actually distributing the source code with that binary because you can reflect it all out via the properties of the language. Um, a lot of the tools, certainly when you're looking for Python or Ruby or anything like that, a lot of the tools that exist work, uh, that just work at that layer too low. You don't want to know necessarily all the DLLs that are being called into. You want to know the uh, logic which is at the application layer. Um, and obviously, there's a huge reliance on actually having physical access to the binaries. You know, those binaries need to be on your disk for you to be able to reverse them. Um, so these are all the things that, in an approach to reverse engineering, we need to understand and evolve to keep up with, with the actual technological landscape which is evolving along with us. Um, I'm certainly, and uh, Dave has accused me of this many times, I'm fallen foul of being a bug snob. Um, you know, ref refusing to, uh, wanting to work on you know, CSRF type bugs or XSS type bugs because you know, they're web hacking bugs, it's not real hacking, it's what kiddies do. Um, but to be fair, if it gets you in, then it gets you in. You know, if you take six months to get in, or you can get in via a cross-site request forgery and it's taking you like two hours, then um, you know, that was a much better approach. And there's a huge amount of attack surface area open uh, on, on the, uh, the, <coughs> the non-overflow type of bugs, which are seen as less advanced. You know, people don't want to talk about them because they don't feel as cool. You know, they want to talk about the, the six months that they spent knee-deep in an assembler. Um, but there is a huge amount of low-hanging fruit in areas that people just aren't looking. Um, and I, depending which side of the fence you're on, it's either fortunate or unfortunate. Not everybody is a Nico. Not everybody can sit and do the things that Nico does with the heap. Um, I'd be there for three years and get nowhere near as far. I'd rather sit for six weeks and do something I'm good at. And I'm sure Dave would appreciate that time he paid me much more. <coughs> so other side effects of this kind of new, uh, new uh, paradigms that we're seeing. Everything is always in beta. That means a lot of features are being tested out. That means that they're seeing both crowd reception. You know, how do people use the app? Do they like this? Do they think that they can monetize on this? Lots of things are rolling in and rolling out. Obviously, if anything's beta, that means it's generally less tested, more likely to have bugs in it. Um, the use of higher level languages means uh, the skill of a developer that needs to be uh, there to develop in that language is a lot, lot less. So they won't have the years of training and experience uh, of writing in a difficult language. Um, easier languages are good in many respects, but it also means that you'll get people who are less, have much less understanding of actually how computers work. Um, you know, they may know Visual Studio and C Sharp, but that's you know, the bounding of their world. Um, and obviously, in an increasingly competitive technological market, the time to market is key. And you know, when you can get a feature out before your competitors is key. And if that means that you're going to do less QA, obviously, this is not news to anyone. Because of all this, obviously, it means that there's lots of bugs. One of the nice things with the kind of Web 2.0 style things is large populations of users, therefore targets, can explode almost overnight. If it's the new big thing, the new viral application, you will get a huge number of new people uh, that are potentially vulnerable to a bug that you found in code that's very untested. And certainly in a, in a platform, uh, in a Python bug, uh, if you do find a good bug, then it becomes cross-platform and cross-architecture. If, you know, if you find a bug in a particular version of, of, of uh, Windows, you have to do a lot of work to make that reliable across language packs, different service packs, uh, different versions of Windows. If you find it in a high-level language and it works, you've got a full cross-platform bug. The same code can work on an Android phone as works on uh, a MacBook. Now, that's great. I mean, again, talking about re uh, return on investment, one set of development and you've compromised everything that uses that code. And people use Python and high-level languages because it is cross-platform and they don't have to redevelop for all those platforms. So another thing just maybe to think about as going through is, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, we're, you know, we're more secure than ever. People have uh, put more effort into the security and their QA and their development processes than ever. But I think it really depends on what metrics that you're looking at. 
Um, if, you're, if you're looking at the number of lines of code, there's more lines of code than there's ever been. People who think they can code. There's more people who release code, who work for companies, and I'm sure you're all sitting there smiling, knowing that there's a bunch of people where you work that should never be let near a computer, yet they release development code. Um, obviously, everything's a lot more connected than it's ever been. Everything now is Web 2.0. Everything has got to do something with the cloud. Um, and obviously, the pervasive technology just throughout life is more than ever. So when people are saying that we're winning the battle, obviously, out in the forum area, you'll get a lot of people telling you uh, via a lot of expensive snake oil that this will make you secure. Actually, when you look at the bigger picture, uh, that might not be so true. What won't be discussed, if my clicker will work, there will be no dropping of commercial application code or bugs from commercial application code, which the tool has found. Um, the lawyers don't seem to agree that what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. They tend to uh, chase you after Vegas and then make your life hell. So uh, we won't be dropping any bugs today. Find your own bugs, use the toolkit. So what are other good reasons for reversing a higher layer? You're closer to the information. You're not looking at the data which the intermediate runtime and therefore compiler created for you. You're looking at what the developer coded. And that's where the bugs are going to be. Um, we've already said that there are likely to be bugs in the runtime, and obviously there are bugs in the runtime, but the uh, easier bugs to find will certainly be from the 18-year-old you know, coder who's done his summer internship at the bank, and now that's their new application that is controlling everything uh, across their infrastructure. So, obviously, if we look at... Uh, this is just a, a standard debugger, a Unity debugger, looking at some Python code. There's a huge number of layers between the actual Python code and the coder, and how it executes in at the assembly layer. I'm not sure if you can see that very well, but you should be able to see like a bunch of calls into the Python, uh, Python 2.5 DLLs, just showing you that there's a huge amount of, of inference between you and the actual logic behind there. What's more interesting in my uh, point of view is, obviously every language has its own quirks and flaws and, and weird ways of doing things. Um, you know, Python and high-level languages are no exception. C is obviously people have done years of research on how exactly the C implementation works. Um, Python is no different than this. There are weirdness uh, in Python. And lots of people make uh, very key mistakes because the people that are programming in Python are often uh, uh, less savvy technically, uh, will see that the program seems to be working right, but don't necessarily understand how it's working properly uh, at the lower layer. So a couple of just kind of classic example bugs. Um, this kind of primitive, anybody want to shout out what the, glare, what the bug is in this bit of code? Anybody not too hungover to be able to shout for that? Uh, Correct, yeah. So we're talking, if you'll click, we're talking a class versus an instant attribute. So the var variable is defined at the class layer. So this means it will be shared between all instances. Um, so you can see that we've, you know, uh, foo and bar, you would imagine that if you looked at foo var and bar var, you would have 10 and 20, but actually you have the coalescence between the two. Now, I mean, this is a silly example, but depending how uh, that object is used, that could give you leverage. Certainly in situations where it's uh, kind of a shared service, if that, uh, if that class is instantiated once and then children of that are set with different users, you can get access to other people's objects. Um, most developers, certainly most kind of Python-oriented developers, and if you add they're a web Python developer, they've got no idea about this kind of stuff. Another example, um, whoever over there who seems to know his Python and want to uh, shout out what's, what's wrong with this? Mutable default. default, exactly right. Um, so when you can see the call me there, uh, you call it, and it looks like it works exactly right. If you appended, you've appended foo onto the end of the, of the list, everything's great. However, if you call, uh, call the call me function without any arguments, the default argument is used. The default argument is created at uh, object creation time, not instantiation time. So you can see that two calls to that, uh, the same object is used, so it's appended to the list. Uh, again, depending on how this bug primitive is used, it can be very useful. I've seen... Um, uh, some lists like this where sockets, uh, socket objects are defined and you can get access to a different socket object and take over a session. Um, again, not a bug that most uh, kind of 
Python developers would really be too aware of. And there's a ton. I mean, there's a whole other talk on ripping Python to pieces. When you start to look at the code and start to look at other people's applications, you can get some pretty cool bugs. So that was the why are we doing this. Um, what were the initial aims? What were we trying to achieve with this? Well, really want to have as rapid assessment and targeting of bugs within Python code as possible. Um, you know, you want it to, the toolkit to highlight where are the areas that you want to look at uh, and to really pull those out for you. Obviously, we've talked about the information layer rather than the data layer. We want to get source code back. We don't necessarily want to get a, full, uh, a, a disassembly. We want to get source code. We want to see what that guy wrote, how he approached things, where are those bugs going to be. And uh, obviously, the motivation for this was there were some anti-reversing techniques that were in use. We want to get around them, but it would be nice not to have a specific uh, block for each technique, have a more general approach that, uh, that is usable against all the techniques and their, the assumptions that those techniques make. So that's the aims, aims that we're going in with things. Now, obviously, we're going to have to talk a little bit about some of the lower level language. I don't know how familiar people are with Python, so we'll blast through this if it's uh, familiar to people and they already know it. Uh, I apologize. Uh, but without it, some of the people may be completely lost if they haven't seen this before. So there are a few different standard file types with Python. Obviously, the .py, which is what, what's written in the, uh, in the source, sorry, where the source code is, is written. That's human readable. Um, it will run on any Python supported platform. Lots of open source products are, are uh, distributed in the .py format. Obviously, you can um, compile this through to a bytecode representation. Uh, the standard bytecode representation is PYC. I'm sure you're all familiar with those. Um, created by compiling or upon import, which is an implicit compile. It's nothing to do with speed of, speed of execution, purely speed up of uh, instantiation. It's the startup time of, if you've already got the PYC there, you don't need to go through the compile step. Um, it is cross-platform bytecode, so you, you can compile it on uh, Windows and use it on Linux or Mac, but it's not cross-version. They reserve the right to between Python 2.4, 2.5, 2.5.2 uh, to uh, change the bytecode up so that one bytecode on uh, bytecode compiled with one version of Python won't be executable by the other version of Python. We're going to have a little look more of that in a second. And they do purposely undocument it to, uh, to allow them to uh, have as much flexibility with changing up the format of the PYC as possible. It's not a particularly complicated format. We'll look at it. Um, but it is undocumented um, so that people don't write a bunch of libraries that depend on this particular format, and then they all break when they change the PYC format. PYO is essentially the same as PYC, um, but it's optimized. Uh, one level of optimization, it will have its asserts removed. Two levels of optimization has the asserts and the inline documentation removed. Um, most of the time, this makes no difference. It just reduces the size of the bytecode. And now and again, if there's code which uses the doc strings, an example being Python, Lex, and Yak, um, the grammars are encapsulated in the doc strings, uh, then if you compile to PYO, you completely blow apart the, applic uh, the application. It doesn't work anymore. So there is a few gotchas in there. And PYD is the most complex uh, serialized format that Python deals with natively. Um, and it's a, called a frozen format. Um, this compiles uh, the Python into C shared objects and uh, allows it to be distributed without having to have the Python runtime there. Um, there's been a great discussion by this of, uh, with uh, Antifreeze, which is a tool presented at Recon, I think, two years ago now. Um, Aaron Portnoy and Ali, Ali um, uh, did a great tool to be able to easily access the internals of a PYD and uh, change the bytecode within, recompile the PYD, and then use it. They had some funny demos with, um, uh, with some uh, games that were developed in Python. A PYD is a very popular format when Windows is being used uh, for, the, for the target platform. And you'll see a lot of people distributing in PYD, assuming that that kind of uh, contains all their intellectual property. No one can get access to it. So a quick look at the PYC format. It's very simple, as I said. It begins with a four-byte magic number. That magic number is to do the version check. So as we said, different versions of Python uh, work with different, uh, have a different magic number. and they know what, what number they're supposed to work with, so they won't execute another set of bytecode from a different interpreter. Um, there's also the OXO, uh, OD <coughs> OA bytes in there to purposely break the bytecode if that bytecode file's been uh, accessed in a text editor or something. 
uh, because it will affect the OXOD. Um, then there's a timestamp. The timestamp's used um, to know whether the uh, PYC needs to be regenerated. If, if there's a PY and a PYC in the same uh, directory, the, uh, and the PY and the timestamp on the PY doesn't match the timestamp embedded in the PYC, then the PYC will be regenerated because the PY could have changed, obviously. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an equality test. It's not a greater than or less than. And then after these eight bytes, there's just the marshaled code objects, uh, which are code objects from Python, which we're going to look at, serialized out. And obviously, there's uh, packaging technologies, PyTXE, PyTAP, uh, CX, Freeze, et cetera, which allows people to bundle their code along with the runtime into one big ball, which makes uh, distribution easier. Um, it's used a lot. Um, it allows, uh, the biggest thing it allows is developers to have a modified runtime, which they develop, uh, which they release with their code, and uh, we'll look at all the modifications which they put into their runtime to try and avoid people being able to reverse the PYCs back out. So object hierarchy. Um, I'm sure most of you know this, but this is kind of how things stack up in Python land. There's a, a module object. Uh, the module object doesn't have any top-level code object. This is done for performance reasons. It's highly annoying uh, when you're trying to reverse things out. Uh, we'll go into the ways to get around this, but there is no code object at the module object layer. Within a module object, obviously you can have classes. Uh, the superclasses are kept in the attribute underscore bases. Classes have methods. Methods have a function of im underscore func, which holds the function object. The function object has a function code object, which holds the code object, and this is what we want. So it's kind of a big onion, and you have to peel it back. Eventually, um, you get back to, to a, uh, a code object, which is a representation. It's quite a verbose representation of the bytecode, variables, run state. It can affect the framing. Uh, we won't discuss framing today, because that will be another 40 minutes. Um, some of the attributes within which you can see the CO code uh, attribute is actually the string representation of the bytecode. Constants names, files names, uh, where it's from, the line number in the source code which this object was from. Now, uh, just to be clear, not everything has a code object. Functions have code objects, generators have code objects, uh, methods have code objects via the fact that they've got a function object within them, but not everything has a code object. Um, so there's some level of uh, reconstruction that we have to do when we can't find a code object for a certain type of object. Oh, wrong way. So that's the stack of, of the objects. Now, uh, obviously, Python has some kind of like bytecode, some, uh, some uh, opcode uh, language, kind of like x86, but very, very much simpler. Um, the opcode got pi represents this at the Python uh, runtime layer. It's just a list of bytecodes, you know, a number, and the uh, mnemonic which, it's, which it maps to. All opcodes are one byte, so there can only be 256 of them. Um, currently, there are 113 defined, um, so there's lots of space for improvement. Optionally, uh, an opcode can have arguments, or an argument. Uh, all arguments are a two-byte argument. Um, this, the opcodes which have arguments are just specified by uh, an attribute, which is has argument, and it will say the value of the opcode, which is uh, above which all of uh, op opcodes have arguments. Um, so it's just two bytes, and obviously how those two bytes are dealt with by the argument is down into the AST layer. So if we have some Python source, which is just print bugs, if we uh, disassemble this, this is just disassembled with the dis module from Python itself, you can see uh, the, uh, the bytecode instructions which are there and the two instructions which have arguments. And if we look at the, uh, actually look in the code object, uh, the CO, uh, CO underscore code object, these are the bytes which come out. Um, obviously, that you can see the 6.4 represents load const, 4.7 uh, four, seven, oh, four, for print item, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very, very simple representation of a language. So we've blasted through, this is how Python works, this is what it looks like, this is the code object, this is how everything stacks up. Uh, what tools exist currently for reversing Python? Um, general categories, obviously it's disassemblers. dis.py comes with Python as standard, it's just a studlib module. Um, you can pass in code objects or uh, higher level objects and it will give a representation like we saw um, a couple of slides back uh, of the instructions and their arguments. 
Uh, this implicitly relies on opcodes.py, uh, which is also obviously a, a standard library module. Um, it looks to opcodes.py for those mappings. So it's looking through the byte stream and it finds each byte and then it refers to opcode.py to be like, what does this represent? What am I going to do with this value? There's some debuggers. Uh, PDB is the standard uh, Python debugger. Uh, it is very extensible. Uh, it itself is extended from BDB, BDP. Um, but it's very much a debugger which is oriented for when you're developing Python code and you've got a bug, where is the problem, rather than you've got a, a closed binary and you want to work out what's in there. Um, so it's, it's a developer aid, not, not really a reversing aid. Um, but it's a good basis upon which to apply other stuff. And a lot of the things, a lot of the functionality which it uh, exposes relies on it having access to a .py file, which from a development point of view is perfectly reasonable for a debugger to assume that it's got access to the source code. Obviously, from our point of view, that's not necessarily uh, true. Um, there are some decompilers, um, varying quality of decompilers. Um, they will take an object such as PYC or a PYO and take it back to source. They'll take that file from disk and reverse it out through the understanding of the marshalling format and the code objects. They will go back and give you some, uh, some source code back. There are free ones, there are commercial ones. Some are applications, some are online services. I'm not sure why anybody would use the online service and submit all their source code, but some people do and also pay for the privilege. Um, there are dpython is an online service. Uh, it tends to be very, very good. Uh, decompile uh, is an old one. It's good for Python 2.4, but it hasn't really kept up with some of the newer stuff. Unpyc is a free uh, tool, a free uh, product application, um, which is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. Um, and uh, it, that's the one that I use to extend a lot of stuff into in Pyretic. And there's also bytecode assemblers and modifiers. Uh, Antifreeze would fall into the modifier category. But there are also byte play and bytecode assembler, which are just general Python utilities to work at the layer of building up things from opcode, so from the bottom up rather than writing Python source code and having it compiled down. Um, they do allow the modification of live objects through some various hacks. Uh, if people are interested, I'd certainly byte play is pretty interesting to look at. They've done some cool stuff there. So if that's all the reverse engineering uh, tools that are available, uh, obviously everybody, all the people that are authoring code can see what those tools are, uh, what are the techniques that they're using to stop people reverse out. Obviously commercial and closed source applications, um, they want to develop in Python because of the speed and the ease and the, and the cost efficiency and the cross-platformness, but they don't want everyone to look at their code. Um, so they've come up with, with an increasingly number of techniques coming out with them uh, trying to stop you being able to peek at the code. Obviously some of the applications we were looking at had this, and this is where everything began. A high-level observation is all the techniques that we've seen really rely on trying to obfuscate the PYC and PYO when it lives on disk. Um, they're trying to, because all the tools that exist so far are um, focused on taking that static uh, file and reversing it back, all the techniques which have been put in place are tr trying to uh, disrupt how that file is interpreted to disrupt those techniques. And it works fairly well. For all the normal tool sets out there, um, they'll fall over. Um, so we're going to fly through very quickly some of the, some of the uh, <clears throat> techniques which are in use. Lots of applications will hide in the packager. So in, in a PYD type file or py to exe, py to app, they will just assume that because it's wrapped up, people don't understand how to unwrap it, um, but there will be standard py, uh, PYCs sitting inside. Um, this is often the technique that's seen uh, used on, on Windows 32. If this is it, you just, um, I mean, the packages use standard formats. Uh, whether it's zip or whatever, it's very easy to get at the PYCs and then you're home and dry, you can use all the standard toolkits. While I was having a look around for what people were doing, found some source code obfuscation, uh, which is kind of an outlier and we're not going to discuss it very much after this. Um, but in, uh, in a similar way to a lot of uh, people when they're distributing JavaScript malware, they will uh, try and confuse the actual, uh, use a lot of uh, exec statements and try and confuse the understanding of the source code itself. Uh, there is a, a product out there that does, does this for Python. So a, a quick look, you can see the standard code on the left, and once it's gone through this obfuscation, it pops out different on the right. Um, I haven't spent time trying to undo the differences which it makes. I don't think it will be particularly difficult. Um, I think it would, I've never actually seen it in the wild, so I haven't put in any effort to try and reverse it. Um, however, when I was looking on the 
uh, vendor's website of this product, I came across another product um, called PoreSense. Uh, it allows you to cat proof your computer. And uh, it does tell you when cat like typing has been detected. Um, I assume the guy that writes these has got way too much time. Uh, and yours for only $19.99. So um, I didn't want to put the link in there in case people worried that I was advertising my own cat sense. Um, but if I can give people the link afterwards if, if they have cat computer problems. So um, the more interesting side of the uh, anti reversing is when people use a modified runtime. This means that they will take uh, the standard Python runtime, uh, screw about with the C to change actually how that runs. So it's, in some sense, it's not standard Python anymore. Um, but this means that when they package it up, they can distribute this runtime with their application. And then, uh, obviously, they can change a lot of the rules. And this is what breaks a lot of the reverse engineering tools for Python, which are already out there. So using a modified runtime allows you to do things such as change the bytecode magic number. Um, it's really simple. Uh, it's used quite a lot. Um, that first magic number in the PYC, like we say, if it doesn't match the version of Python which is being used, everything just falls apart. Python just refuses to, to look at it. If they're, uh, if they're distributing PYCs with a changed magic number, um, you're trying to use standard Python on it, your standard Python will just balk. Um, it's defined in uh, import.c. In Python, you can see all these different versions that are out. They tend to increment, uh, for every version of Python, they'll increment the magic number by 10. It's essentially an arbitrary magic number. It doesn't have any cool like uh, dead beef or anything. It's just a number. Um, obviously, the very easy way around this is you can just flick the first four bytes back to a version of, of Python which you know you know that you know that they're running Python 2.54. Change the bytes back to that, and then you're good good to go. Um, very rarely do you see this used by itself. It's just used as an extra barrier. You know, if people fall at this hurdle, then you know they're pretty lame anyway. Um, but it does stop out of the box most reversing uh, and decompilers. So it's very simple to implement, uh, but very simple to get around as well. Um, changing in the marshalling formats, as we said uh, in the Python uh, PYC file, there was uh, eight bytes of, of header essentially, and then uh, marshaled formats. Uh, the marshalling is controlled by marshalling.c in the Python runtime. If you change how those objects are serialized into the PYC, and obviously you need to do the, the conversant changes of how you're going to serialize them back out, um, you can make that as complicated, encrypted, or, or whatever as you, as you like. Um, if people can't understand how to unpack the code object out, then they can't get access to the code object. Um, this, is, you know, this is used uh, quite a bit, and obviously it can be arbitrarily uh, complicated. If you want to reverse at the C layer, you should be able to find out what they're doing. But if they change, you know, it's, it's a lot of effort to find out what they're doing. Um, we'll talk about a better technique to actually get uh, how they're remarshalling things. And opcode remapping. Um, one of the more complicated obfuscations, we've talked about that there's the opcode tables, a number which represents an instruction. Um, and obviously, that's a standard across Python. Uh, some developers uh, will rewrite these opcodes so uh, the instruction that used to be number 40 is now number 80, and mess them all up now. Obviously, if you don't have op, uh, access to the, to the rewritten opcode table, then trying to get back out from that is, is a problem. Um, and this is one of the techniques which, uh, which we've got, uh, we can do again at the Python layer without having to go into the C layer and redo all the work every time they change their opcode table. Um, so the general approach of, given all these techniques, um, what is the general approach that we're going to take to try and break them? Uh, really want to remove the reliance on the disk, uh, the access to the disk of the, PY, uh, the PYCs on disk, or the PY, uh, PYO. Um, it'd be nice to just let the application undo its own protection, because obviously it's got to undo everything it's done to then execute the code in Python space. Um, so let's let the application undo everything it's done, and uh, jump in and then start accessing the objects. Um, and not worry about the obfuscations which they put into the file layer. Obviously, we need to get in process. Um, this is pretty simple to do. And then uh, once we're in process, we can jump around in memory, access all the objects, and be uh, clever and try and reconstruct source code, but not relying on anything from disk. Um, a nice kind of side effect of this is if you're not relying on things on disk, then uh, you can start to access things remotely. Uh, you know, there are a lot of cloud environments that use Python as an access language or a container language. And if they allow you to access uh, kind of into the Python main thread, if they allow you to, uh, to execute Python code, 
these kind of techniques will allow you to reverse out source code from the objects which you can uh, communicate with. So even though you might not actually have the physical file, you can still reverse out the source code behind those objects, which is obviously very useful. Moving forward will become increasingly useful, and it's an area certainly that's going to I'm going to put more work into. I think it's um, probably more interesting in many ways than um, than some of the stuff that the pirated toolkit has sits so far. So getting in process. If there is an application which is distributed, it's purely PYCs. Um, we want to get inside that main, that main thread, uh, that Python main thread, so we can execute our own Python. How do we get in? in uh, uh, and obviously, they've obfuscated their runtime, so we need to use their interpreter to execute their bytecode. So we can't, we can't pad it with our own stuff on, on front. <clears throat> so we need to use their interpreter, uh, but the import rules for Python still apply. We've already talked about that there's a timestamp within the, um, the Python runtime. If that timestamp doesn't match, then uh, the file name .py for that PYC will be looked at in preference. Um, so if you uh, create a file, if there was foomodule.pyc, which you're wanting to get in process, rename it to foomodule original, take your module, rename it to foo.py, your foo.py will have a, uh, a newer timestamp, it will be accessed in preference to uh, their foo.pyc, and then from your foo.module, uh, you can execute arbitrary bytecode, that arbitrary bytecode can then access back into the renamed object that you've made, and you can mirror out the objects uh, from within it, which I think I've got. Oh, no, I took it out. Um, so you can blindly mirror the, the module that you've replaced. You can introspect into that, grab all its objects, and proxy between them. So as far as the application's concerned, you're just manning the middle in, but now you've got uh, your in execution. Um, so, and I haven't seen any, uh, any commercial application that's tried to stop doing that. They just assume, oh, it's PYC. No one can get in process. I don't know, it's strange. They seem to have put a lot of effort into other areas and missed this glaringly obvious front door. Um, but, I mean, it's good for us. The non-standard marshalling, which we talked about, um, it can be arbitrarily complex, essentially. And uh, I found it to be a real pain in the ass. Um, I didn't... I spent a little bit of time looking at it. I would, initially, in my head, I wanted to take the obfuscated marshalled code and kind of get it back to a normal PYC, and then I could put that PYC through uh, a normal decompiler. Um, it, it, was, it was just painful, and I, uh, eventually I was like, well, there's no point. I can let the runtime do whatever it needs to do to unobfuscate, unmarshal whatever format they're using, and it will be put into memory as an object like any other Python object. I understand now that Python object is going to be standard. I understand how those objects are. I'm going to be able to get a lot more leverage using uh, the Python objects and every time trying to work out what craziness they've done in their marshalling. Um, so essentially, I admitted defeat and uh, started going at the problem in a different way. Opcode remapping, however, and obviously we need to re-remap their, their, their new opcode table, um, is difficult or was difficult, um, but it ended up being quite a simple technique. Um, obviously, if we're wanting to analyze a runtime, um, if we want to analyze an object at runtime, and we're looking into that C, C, uh, CO underscore code object. If the opcodes there are just craziness, then all of our standard tools aren't going to be able to understand what that byte stream means. So we need to understand the opcode mappings if, we under, if, if we're to understand the logic and the bytecode which is in, in that string. Obviously, it's this understanding, um, this requirement of understanding, which is what the remapping is trying to break. So <clears throat> uh, the simple solution to working out uh, obviously, we don't have access to the opcodes.h that they remapped, and uh, obviously everybody takes away the opcodes.py, so they can't just import and look at their table. Um, so the easy way around this is essentially a known plain text attack against the object. So if we, uh, as we've already said, the, the Python instructions are pretty simple. It's like one byte and maybe then another two, depending on. Um, so if we take that, the standard byte stream on the left, which is a you know, standard Python bytecode, um, and if it's been remapped with the values, you can see that 6.4 has been remapped to 4.4, 4, 4, 4 7 to 11, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if um, we carry on doing this, and we can build up a remap table, um, so essentially we uh, I'll get to the step by step. Um, we stream through as much uh, 
Python source, we, we can, we've got access to all their obfuscated uh, modules. They distribute a runtime that's got all the standard library modules, you know, os.py, all the stuff that comes normally. Um, we also have access to the plain text because that's standard Python. Um, and we also, so we generate the PYCs using standard Python. We've got access to their PYCs that are using their obfuscated, and then we just map them together and be like, all right, you know, uh, 10's changed to 11, 12's changed to 13, build up the new map. Now we've got our opcode map. We can, now we've kind of got the, the, the Oracle, and we can use, uh, we can use the CO code objects because we understand what they're representing now. Um, to do this in Pyretic, uh, I came up with, oh, wrong way. I came up with a, I mean, file format's probably a bit of a grand name for it, but a, a, PY fee, a PYB file. Um, this is taking the, the, the CO underscore code objects from a variety of different, um, these modules, the standard library modules, uh, and serializing them, uh, literally just rawly concatenating them into a file in a, in a predictable way. Uh, do this for the standard like reference Python, do this for your obfuscated Python, and then collide these two streams to get your opcode remapping. Um, that was much easier than looking at the PYCs themselves because if there was uh, marshalling obfuscation in place, that would break that, that, that looking at both PYCs. So we've gone to kind of an agnostic format, which is I called a PYB, um, and this allows you to do the opcode remapping but without having to rely on the unmarshalling, uh, which you may not understand because it's been done in the C layer. So the step-by-step -step remapping, um, you, that, the big gotcha that kind of I fell for, uh, I fell for a few times. Uh, you've got to have the, the exact same version of Python running. Um, so find out the version of Python that, that you've got in process, so you can you can pull out like sys version and find out what version. But you've got to have it down to the minor version. So if they're running in Python 2.5.4, make sure that your reference Python, which you're using, is 2.5.4. Otherwise, um, the bytecode which is produced will shift, and and, it, and and then you won't get the collisions that you need. So. Find the, find the right uh, Python runtime. Um, with the unmodified Python, just the standard library Python, uh, generate our PYBs, which are these concatenated raw code objects. Um, and then from the obfuscated Python, do the same thing for all of the standard library objects that they've got available. And then diff, essentially diff those two, build up a new opcode map, then use that opcode map uh, in your disassembly and decompilation. So it's a few steps, and we're going to, um, I'll, sh I'll show you the example in, in one second. Uh, because obviously uh, packaged in, so pray to the demo gods. So uh, I've created like a, a silly little test application. Uh, it's only uh, only PYC uh, uh, distributed, and we'll just use this to exemplify the the, the decompilations. Um, what I what I've done this is this is a standard Python like normal Python two point six point two. Uh, this is uh, a, m a modified Python that uh, changes the magic and does opcode remapping. So we can um, we can see uh, the 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 collisions taking place. So uh, we'll talk about uh, repdb, which is my uh, extension to the debugger uh, in a bit. But we'll just jump in into this now. I'll pull up my cheat sheet. I don't have to type in and get my paths wrong. Uh, so if we set up a new project, uh, <coughs> we can now see, so we've got the project layout. Um, everything's, everything's empty, PYBs are empty. So we're going to generate the reference PYBs. Then we're going to generate the obfuscated PYBs. Then we're going to collide them. And then we will see that, and uh, the code reproduces, then writes out a brand new opcode.py and opcodes.py. Opcodes.py is what the equivalent that umpyc uses for the decompilation. So if we do uh, gen reference 2.6, um, we point this at uh, the standard. So you can see there's Python 2.6.2. LibPy 2.6. These are all the standard Python library modules, and now we're going to generate uh, a, a shitload of uh, PYBs from them. So compiling them all up. Generating all the PYBs. OK, so we've generated a ton of PYBs. If we look in our reference, P2.6.2, 
PYB, we can see all those there. Um, if we look, uh, show the format of the PYB. So you've seen it's just concatenated code objects. Um, it looks pretty meaningless, but it means that we can collide, collide in like a, a, a neutral format. So now we'll do the same for the obfuscated PYBs. So gen obfuscated to six. And now, rather than pointing at the standard libraries, um, the standard library modules, we're pointing at the obfuscated Python's library modules. So we'll generate the, the PYBs for all of those. Now, it looks like it failed, but that's just all the warnings, uh, the future's warnings. Uh, so I promise you, it didn't fail quite that bad. Uh, as proof, we've got all our uh, obfuscated PYBs here. So now we're going to collide them and remap. And so if we scroll, scroll up, so we're just like literally taking all of them and smacking them against each other. And we can see you know, for import name, it's gone from 107 to 108. The, the shift that I did in the obfuscated Python was just incrementing the numbers by one, but it could have been anything. Um, <clears throat> and so now it says we want to write out our new uh, opcode.py, which we do. And so if we look in the libs, we'll see you know, a new opcode.py has been generated. Uh, it's a remap by Pyretic, blah, 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 blah. And the same for opcodes.py, which is uh, essentially the same kind of file, but for uh, the unpyc uh, decompiler. So we've collided both streams, remapped them, regenerated our opcode.py, and now we are in a position that we can use a lot of the standard tools because we've undone their, we've re-remapped their opcode remapping. Um, so we'll jump back into the demo, and I'll show you the decompilation later. That wasn't what I meant to do. That's better. So um, we've talked about the obfuscations, and we talked about how we got around them at the Python layer. Um, now we're talking about why do we want to decompile in memory rather than statically off disk. Um, So we use um, like in-memory decompilation uh, for all the reasons that we said, uh, because often you won't be able to actually access the files on disk, either because they're sitting on a different system somewhere or because the, the, all the obfuscation attempts have been placed onto the, uh, around the actual data on the disk rather than the data in memory. Um, all, stand, all the standard Python decompilers require access to the code, to the, to the, to the file objects. Um, and uh, I mentioned earlier that module objects don't have a code object, which is a bit of a pain. So it means that we have to do, uh, we can't do pure decompilation, we have to do reconstruction, which is kind of inferring the source code rather than taking a code object and decompiling it back out through its assembly instructions. We have to pro poke and prod at objects and make best guesses about what they actually look like. Um, so that's more reconstruction than uh, actual disassembly, uh, sorry, uh, decompilation. And this is from the Python documentation. You know, a module object does not have a code. It's for, it's for performance reasons, and it makes life far more difficult than it needs to be. Um, so once an object is imported uh, into a run in Python, um, a module can't be decompiled at the module layer because there's no object who can decompile. So we have to do the reconstruction. Um, it's kind of like runtime analysis. We prod and poke. We ask a lot of questions about the object. We, do, we use a lot of the underlying uh, double underscore attributes to try and work out more about the object. Um, and then we can have a fairly good guess, not perfect, and there's some catch, 10? Wow. <laughs> um, so this kind of, uh, we can pull together, uh, di different parts of this source code will come from different areas. Um, the stuff within test.func, uh, will that can actually come from the uh, co.code object because it has one. However, the imports and the foo equals nine, the bar, all the attribute assignments can't come from a code object because there's no code object for it to come from. Um, so we have to do uh, a lot of dancing around and, and reconstruct it. There are some things that we can never be able to reconstruct. Um, as we can see, there's like an, foo has an initial value of nine, uh, but then foo is changed to 10. At runtime, we're never gonna know that that was initially nine. Uh, we can only get its current state. Um, calls to functions, uh, like bar, uh, we won't see that bar called test func 3, we'll see that bar test func 3 returned value whatever. 
So we get the returns from functions. But again, this is all at the top, top layer, and most people don't program the functions at the top layer. So um, it's, it's not perfect, but for when you're looking for bugs, it's good enough. And that's often what you need. You know, you're looking for areas of, of code which are going to be good for bugs, and it's good enough. So the Pyretic Toolkit. Um, it's pure Python, obviously. Um, and it just came from my need to wanting to not do custom reversing on every single Python application. Um, so it came from laziness. The so three main areas, decompilation and reconstruction uses uh, unpyc, but it's extended. It's made a lot more um, uh, error tolerant. A lot of decompilers are very brittle. As soon as there's any deviance in the standard bytecode, they'll fall over. Uh, so unpyc has been made a lot more robust. Uh, all the patches that I've written for unpyc are going to go back to the guy who wrote it, some Russian guy. Um, and uh, there's three different types of decompilation which we can show. Uh, so decompilation in Pyretic is both a traversal, how you get from one object to the next, as well as how you then decompile that object. So, um, and depending, depending what constraints and what obfuscations are in place depend on what is the right technique to use. Um, so we can walk the file system, get access to the module object. If we have access to an un uh, if we have access to unmarshal, uh, if they haven't removed that, then we can just demarshal that module object and decompile it. Um, best case scenario, we'll get high quality source code uh, out of it. But we have to have access to the unmarshal. If we don't have access to the unmarshal, um, then we can walk the file system and do the object decompilation, uh, the in-memory decompilation, and the source reconstruction that we spoke of. Um, again, we'll lose some of those top layer objects, um, but it's still pretty good, and we'll see, we'll see the compare and contrast to, to them. Um, and if we don't have access to any of the files, so we can't traverse a file system saying there's this file and that file and that file and that file, we can take an object from memory and then look at all the other objects which it's related to and then do the in-memory decompilation on them. So the, uh, you don't need access to files on disk, but the, you will only be able to decompile things that are instantiated into memory within the current state. So there's pros and cons to each technique. Uh, it depends what obfuscations are in place, uh, but all are available in Pyretic. Um, well, it's flown off the side. Um, there is, uh, can I shift? Uh, the opcode remap, which we've seen, obviously it makes the process of colliding these, uh, these uh, uh, streams of PYBs a lot easier, uh, puts it into a few commands. And there's uh, repdb, which is uh, a superclassed PDB that gives you access to a lot more reverse engineering functionality. Um, obviously, it was what I was using before to do the opcode remapping. Um, also, I had like, a lot of stuff that I put in for laziness, allows calling out to uh, create call graphs, etc. So from the runtime, you can see how all the objects are relating to each other in a call graph sense, which can give you a good way of overviewing a project and where to start focusing um, and putting more time. Uh, so there's some future directions. There's loads of work still to be done. Um, you know, obviously having it in a, in a GUI would be nice. Um, UmpyC is good. Um, I'm not knocking the guy who wrote it, but this is certainly not perfect. It doesn't implement everything. Um, uh, it would be nice to have some kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of vis visualized call graph for seeing all the blocks, double click on a block, and you can get to the, uh, to the source code. Um, and obviously, it's going to be made into an online service, so you can all send me your bugs. Um, so before we hit the conclusions, we'll do, I'll show you the, the remapping, conclude, and then we can get out of here. So we've, uh, done, we've done the remapping. Let's do the geek decompilation on, on the files. Uh, I'll show you all three types of decompilation, and we can compare the, uh, the code which is produced and see you know, kind of where it sucks in places and doesn't in others. So this is the first type. Uh, if you've got access to an unmarshalling uh, command, you can take the objects from, from uh, and just unmarshal them out and decompile them um, after, obviously, the remapping has, has taken place. Uh, so this is the test app uh, that I spoke of. So if we just decompile that, it's all very quick. Uh, this goes into the source code and some ridiculously long path. Yay. Right. So we can see um, this is 
you know, this is a good quality decompile. It's got the imports, it's got the top-level objects, it's got the, the function calls. This is because we decompiled from an unmarshaled object. So this is, I mean, this is, this is good, um, but only if we've got the, the unmarshaled object, uh, the unmarshaled capability. Um, if we haven't, and then we can do the memory decompile. I have to go all the way back and then all the way back out again. And you'll see the areas where the, the, at the top layer where reconstructions had to be used rather than proper decompilation, you'll see some changes. Um, so you can see there's kind of you know, this long, strange uh, class uh, there, uh, rather than it just being a test class. Um, obviously, the ordering uh, D, uh, we only, that was the call to the, to the function. Uh, we only get the return of its value rather than it being a function. But you know, it's good enough. You can understand the logic of what's going on. And then if we didn't have access to uh, any files on disk and wanted to do everything in memory, we can do the same thing. Oh. Uh, rather than obviously applying it to a path, we have to apply it to, a, uh, to an actual object. So if we import the test app, you can see it's, it's in the, uh, the namespace here. So now if we just point the, this object uh, into the pure memd compile. This time we don't have such a long path to go along. You see it's named a bit funny because that's how it comes out in the namespace. Um, but you, we still get a fairly decent decompiler and that's purely from, from the object. So we haven't touched disk at all. This is just from something that was available in runtime and we've got a pretty good, good enough to find bugs with decompilation. Um, that's about as exciting. I haven't got any time to show like the call graphing or the calling out to the extra functionality. So conclusions. Obviously the development and distribution landscape are changing. Um, we need to evolve uh, to make sure that our work and reversing and finding bugs it maintains a decent ROI, that we don't have to spend a year looking at something before we can get a good bug. Higher level languages actually give you a very rapid return on investment just because it's an area that not much many people have looked into. There are Python reverse engineering techniques. We've had a little bit of a taxonom taxonomy across them. Um, uh, if we, as a, as a general rule, go from a static decompilation into in memory, we get some good advantages, some drawbacks, but I think those drawbacks are outweighed by the advantages that we get. And Pyretic uh, is kind of proof of concept for people to begin playing around with the in memory decompilation stuff. Um, rather than like you know a commercial tool, you know, kind of take it and have a play with it. So with that, are there any questions? What kind of oh, uh, you and then you. Uh, what kind of future are you looking at taking it into attack live? Or <clears throat> what's it, kind of so taking it into attack live. Yeah, like uh, you get in there and play with it live. At the, I mean, at the moment, um, it's purely been based on grabbing the source code, analyze offline, and then attack afterwards. Um, obviously, there's getting in process to a Python, you know, a Python service, and then doing like cool things, like swapping out uh, code objects for other code objects. They're supposed to be immutable, but if the code object doesn't get refreshed, um, you, there, there are ways to swap it out. So you could uh, essentially Trojan in memory the Python objects. So it would look good on disk. Um, all of those are interesting areas, not really what Pyretic's looking at, but certainly areas that I'm looking at. Um, so I'll speak to about next year. <laughs> and the guy. Uh, at the end of the first half of the demo, there was a thing in big capital letters that said opcode remap mismatch. What caused that? Um, the opcode remap mismatch is when uh, my PY, if the bytecode produced in the PYBs, doesn't quite match up. So um, obviously, I've just got some simple logic saying, you know, read a byte, you know, is the byte the same or different? Um, is the value of that byte one that looks like it should have arguments, yes or no? Um, so it's, uh, you would have seen it said, uh, like, you know, 100 opcodes remapped. So it's like 13 opcodes missing. Um, that, will be, that could be because the, um, the opcode, uh, the, the bytecode that we generated those opcodes weren't actually generated within that bytecode stream. Um, but it's a good question. It's something that I'm working on that wasn't ready for today is rather than going over the standard libraries like we were and colliding them, 
just having one Python file that uh, generates all of the known opcodes. So you just uh, compile that in the obfuscated, compile it in the regular, and then you'll get every opcode, so you get 100% completion every time. Um, uh, that's something you shouldn't be too hard. I just haven't had time to, to do it, but that's where it will be going. It will mean a lot less process and a lot less work. Anybody else? Oh. Uh, so the, co the compilation um, is more really in the Martian. They will affect the often affect the compile.c as well, um, but they they have to undo all that to get it back into a memory object. So almost I don't really care what they're doing with the with their compilation um, because once it's compiled, it goes into a standard object and they have to access it back out anyway. If I can access it in a Python namespace, um, they can be as funky as they like in the compilation, but. You know, they've got it into a runtime object, and I'll just introspect that because that will be a standard runtime object. I mean, they could go further and then start to essentially rewrite Python, but then that's outweighing all the advantages that they went to using Python for anyway. Um, so I don't think they'll ever go too far on doing too much. Um, I think they're just putting enough barriers in place to stop people just taking a standard PYC and reversing it back out. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>